All right. Good morning, everybody. I see we've got people kind of joining in on um, today to uh, hear our conversation with Attorney General Derek Schmidt. Um, I'm Ann Smith-Tate. I'm the President and CEO of the Shawnee Chamber. I want to thank all of you for your time today and a big thank you to the Attorney General for joining us today. Um, as always, we will be taking uh, some questions so you can um, put those either in the Q&A function or in the chat function and uh, we'll be um, asking those uh, towards the end of uh, Mr. Schmidt's uh, presentation. So um, first, let me just, uh, as a way of introduction, uh, tell you a little bit about uh, Attorney General Schmidt. Derek Schmidt was elected uh, as the 44th Attorney General uh, for the state of Kansas in 2010 and then was reelected in 2014 and 2018. He is the state's second longest serving uh, attorney general and in 2018 received more votes than any other candidate for attorney general in the state of Kansas history. Under Attorney General Schmidt's leadership, the office has focused on prosecuting crimes against children, protecting their senior citizens from scams and ripoffs, recovering record setting amounts of money for Kansas consumers and taxpayers, providing professional legal services for the state of Kansas, and standing up against illegal overreach by federal government. Attorney General Schmidt has personally and successfully argued three Kansas cases before the U.S. Supreme Court. He has led successful efforts to strengthen Kansas law and law against human trafficking, to toughen penalties for defrauding senior citizens and from stealing from taxpayers, to build a modern forensic science laboratory for the Kansas Bureau of Investigation. Uh, he's worked to strengthen consumer privacy laws and to improve investigation of crimes against children. Schmidt has been honored with the Criminal Justice Professional of the Year Award from Wichita Crime Commission, the Friend of Law Enforcement Award from the Kansas Sheriff's Association and the Policy Maker of the Year Award from the Kansas County and District Attorneys Association and the Guardian of Small Business Award from the Kansas Chapter of the National Federation of Independent Businesses. He has served as a 2017-2018 President of the National Association of Attorneys General and was named the nation's outstanding Attorney General for 2019. So before being elected Attorney General, Schmidt served as a Kansas State Senator representing part of Southeast Kansas as a chairman of the State Agriculture Committee and Senate Majority Leader. He previously served as counsel for Governor Bill Graves and as a legislative assistant to U.S. Senator Nancy Landon Kassenbaum. Um, Attorney Schmidt is a graduate of Independence High School and studied at the Independence Community College. He earned his bachelor's degree in journalism from the University of Kansas, his master's in international politics from the University of Leicester, did I say that right? The United Kingdom, his law degree from Georgetown University Law Center, and his doctorate in law from the University of Kansas School of Law. Schmidt and his wife are the parents of two daughters. Thank you so much. That is quite an impressive resume. I am. Um, so I'm excited to hear what you have to say and I'll turn it over to you. Um, I'm already thinking lots of questions just based on your um, history and all the things that you're working on. So um, uh, Attorney General Schmidt, thank you so much for joining us and we'll let you take it away. Great, thank you, Anne. I've made a note to uh, truncate the bio a little bit. But thank you for, uh, thank you for uh, doing this and thanks to everybody for joining today. I, uh, quick to say, you know, we don't get to get out as much as we are accustomed to around here. And so this is just, I'm almost giddy about the chance to have human interaction with folks that, um, you know, we aren't all co-employed with all respect to our employees. They're terrific, but we've seen a lot of each other in the last uh, few months, either in person or over these sorts of, of uh, 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 calls. Um, my apologies if this looks a little formal. I've discovered I'm better on my feet than I am seated. That's just a reality. And so, um, tried to structure it that way. Uh, I thought today I'd say a few words. Uh, I've made a few notes. I, I'll, I'll mention a few things I'm going to talk a little bit about, and then I'd really prefer to go in whatever direction you all are interested in. Um, glad to talk about anything that we do or have a role in, and if for some reason I can't talk about it, I'll just tell you that, but uh, for the most part I should be able to. So my game plan today, I thought I'd say a little bit about uh, just uh, from the AG's office perspective, uh, both our role in the COVID response and uh, kind of how things have been for the last several months. I won't dwell on it. Everyone I know has our own stories on how things have been, but I'll share a bit uh, from the perspective of this office. 
Uh, then I was going to say a word about a trilogy of U.S. Supreme Court cases that we argued and won this term. Um, it was actually a huge deal for our office, and we think for Kansas, but uh, it sort of got lost in the COVID news when the decisions all came out. I won't dwell on them, but I'll share them, and one of them does have uh, a, a business connection, so I'll particularly focus on it. Uh, next, I thought I'd say a word about uh, some liability issues and uh, particularly talk a little bit about uh, some of the contact tracing liability issues and also touch on some of the statutory liability limitations that our legislature enacted uh, and at least mention some that it looks like Congress is going to debate. Uh, say a word about our, our office's consumer work during the COVID response, the scams, the ripoffs, those types of things that we've been doing enforcement on and then maybe touch quickly on uh, uh, the current discussion about schools and offer whatever thoughts I have on that, not on the policy in particular, but on some of the mechanics. Uh, so that's the game plan. It sounds like a longer list than it is. I don't plan to dwell on any of those uh, for too long a period of time. In terms of the AG's office, as I mentioned, uh, like a lot of folks, we've been under uh, sort of a self-imposed house arrest, if you will, for the last what, four months now. Uh, we've had most of our people working remotely. There was a period there in April where it was literally just a, a, a tiny skeleton crew out of our usual 160 employees here. I think we had about uh, eight of us maybe who were in the office with any regularity. I stayed here throughout. I thought somebody needed to be uh, at the helm, and so I was, uh, and we had a core group that was. But for the most part, like most businesses or other organizations, uh, we had our people working remotely. And we've learned, as I suspect many organizations have, that there are pluses and minuses to that. Certainly, we have a lot of employees who have appreciated the flexibility, and we respect that. Uh, at the same time, it's been a little bit harder to maintain what I'll call accountability, and I don't mean that in a, uh, a scolding sense. I just mean it's a little harder to know, uh, as the leader of an organization, what all is going on when your people are scattered, and it's a little harder to uh, interact. So we're trying to, as we move past that, we're trying to you know, find the right balance to maximize productivity on behalf of the state and taxpayers to do the work that we do, um, retain those things that were good about what we learned during the COVID response, and nudge everybody back to uh, what might be a better, more typical way to operate. We're now running at around 60%, maybe a shade over, of our employees physically in the office routinely. Uh, we have a fairly large office building, and so we are, we are physically separated within the building. We have the mask requirements within the building. We have sanitation requirements. It's almost like a, a cluster of small offices within one large uh, office facility. But at least it's helped somewhat. Everybody else is still working remotely. Um, you know, we're, uh, we have a special relationship with the Kansas Bureau of Investigation, and they've, as you might imagine, had some real issues. They've got everybody back working, but not in the ordinary fashion. And uh, obviously very difficult to uh, maintain all of your precautions when you're responding to a crime scene. Uh, and so um, I think they've really struggled with issues perhaps a bit more than we've uh, had to on our watch. One thing I might say about uh, the, the subject matter that we've dealt with, uh, and I mention it just because it is so unusual, but in addition to all the ordinary stuff that you'd expect an AG's office to be doing, um, some of which Ann mentioned uh, in, in the lead-in, and by the way, a lot of the stuff that we do, you don't see in Johnson County because um, uh, many of our responsibilities, not all of them, but many of them, there's a choice. Either local authorities can do it or we can do it. And in Johnson County, typically your local enforcement authorities like to do their own work and we work very closely with them, but you're much more likely to see Steve Howe and the folks at the DA's office prosecuting a criminal case than, than us. Even though we do a lot of criminal prosecution, uh, we're just not needed in Johnson County, so we're available. But so anyway, uh, our, our public looking face is a little bit different from the vantage point of, of Johnson County and also Sedgwick County than it may be from many other parts of the state. Be that as it may, one of the tasks that's consumed a lot of time uh, in the last four months for us has been one that we didn't do at all previously. And that's providing uh, legal input and guidance to the governor, the governor's office, the adjutant general's department, other state agencies, uh, and reviewing uh, draft documents of uh, emergency orders that the governor has issued. There have been many of them, more than we think at any other time in state history. You know, obviously Kansas has operated like every other state uh, in an area we don't ordinarily operate. And uh, government officials at all levels have exercised extraordinary powers that they don't ordinarily exercise. 
and we've been sort of the, 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 the voice that's usually whispered in their ear, uh, occasionally stood up and, and held up our hand and, and maybe yelled a little louder, uh, saying, you know, this is an extraordinary time that requires extraordinary measures, but there are still limits. There are still constitutional and legal limits on the ability of government to do certain things. And process still matters because process ensures that all voices are considered. And uh, circumventing process sometimes is just impermissible and often is, is dangerous. So that's been the role we've played. It's consumed a tremendous amount of time. And I'll close on that when we get down to the school's uh, discussion here at the end. So that's been our, um, you know, what we did on our spring and summer vacation description, so to speak. Let me say a word about those U.S. Supreme Court cases. This is the one thing that has nothing to do with COVID and emergency response, but I want to mention it uh, for the reasons I, I described earlier. Kansas, uh, we, let me back up. The, the Attorney General's office handles all U.S. Supreme Court advocacy for the state of Kansas. Uh, if a case from Kansas that involves a state entity, a public state entity, goes to the U.S. Supreme Court, our office will be involved. And ordinarily, and in, in almost every case, and I actually think it's been in every case since I've served in this office, uh, we have been the lead uh, advocate for the state. We do the briefing, we do the argument, working with others very closely, but we are uh, the ones that carry the ball at that level. Um, we love doing that work. Uh, it's unique. There's nothing quite like it. If you happen to be uh, an attorney and you, you do courtroom advocacy, there simply is nothing comparable to U.S. Supreme Court advocacy. It is its own creature with its own uh, flavor and tenor and uh, requires some amount of specialization that so far we've been, been, been able to provide. Going into this last Supreme Court term that started in October of 19 and ended uh, just, a, well, early July, actually, early this month, it ran a little over time. Um, we actually had three cases out of Kansas that we were handling for the state at the court teed up for oral argument. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, perhaps, three cases in a term, but to put that into context, uh, we are quite certain it's the first and only time in the history of the state of Kansas that the state's had three cases up for oral argument uh, at the high court in a single term. We think it may be the only time any state has had three cases up in a single term. We've not yet found another state that's had more than three up, and we've consulted closely with all the big ones that have robust uh, Supreme Court practices, the ones who would be most likely to be there. And in any event, when you add in this other sort of little wrinkle, which is we argued the three cases uh, from first to last within a four-week period, uh, exactly four weeks to the day from the time we argued the first, we argued the second in the middle, we argued the third four weeks hence, uh, we are almost certain that no state's done that before. So a little bit of Supreme Court trivia, it's something our, our team is really proud of, and particularly because things went well for Kansas in all three cases, the state's position prevailed in all of them. Let me just mention those, and I'll describe one in more detail. The other two, I'll just mention the subject matter. Um, in fact, I'll do those in reverse order. We prevailed in Kansas versus uh, Charles Glover. This was a Fourth Amendment reasonable suspicion traffic stop case. And if you're really interested, holler at me afterwards, and we'll talk about it. I'll leave it at that. It was a case out of Douglas County. We also prevailed in uh, James Craig Kaler versus Kansas. This was a, a, a death penalty case, a terrible homicide case out of Osage County. It's a fellow who killed four members of his family around uh, Thanksgiving of 2009 is convicted and his appeal uh, was challenging the constitutionality of the Kansas, the way Kansas structures its what I'll call the insanity defense in Kansas. We have a minority rule in Kansas. We're one of only about four states, maybe five, depending on how you, how you classify one, uh, that approaches insanity evidence in a different way from the majority rule. And the question was whether the constitution allows us to do that and the court said yes. Uh, and then the third case, uh, which I'll spend just a little bit more time on because it does have some business angle to it, uh, was Kansas versus Garcia. This is also perhaps interesting because this was a case out of Johnson County. We worked very closely with uh, Steve Howe's office, the district attorney's office there. Uh, this was actually a consolidation of three different cases. Mr. Garcia just happened to be first uh, in the listing, and so it will bear his name. Uh, but all three cases had similar types of facts. All three were identity theft or related types of cases all three arose in the employment context. And in all three of these cases, it happened to be the case that the reason that the individual, the employee, committed identity theft um, and used the stolen information, social security number and, and other identity in uh, the job application process was that they weren't in the country lawfully and therefore didn't have a social security number. 
Now we're quick to say, we argued, and I believe from the beginning, uh, that these are employment and ID theft cases. They're not immigration cases, but perhaps not surprisingly, uh, our opponents in the case made exactly the opposite argument and did their best uh, to sort of you know, turn these into immigration cases that therefore got bound up in the, the passions on that issue, both nationally and locally. Uh, but for us, they were pretty straightforward. Uh, our argument was, uh, to borrow the words from the Kansas Court of Appeals, which uh, applied the phrase here, you don't get a get out of jail free card if you steal somebody else's identity and, and lie with it, use it to gain employment or otherwise, merely because of your immigration status. Um, your immigration status is irrelevant. It doesn't help you, it doesn't hurt you. And therefore our argument was Kansas could enforce its ID theft and related statutes in this context, just as we do in any other context. And the court ultimately agreed. Uh, the court unanimously reversed the Kansas Supreme Court um, on their rationale for why our court had held that Kansas law was preempted. And then on a narrower five to four decision, um, looked at an alternative reason that our law might be preempted and said, no, Kansas is not preempted there either. So the bottom line is um, ID theft enforcement can now occur against an employee, not employers, employee uh, in the employment context. And uh, we think that's good news because we don't think there ought to be, as the court said, a get out of jail free card in this particular application. So, you know, big time for us at the Supreme Court. Unfortunately for us, all three of those decisions were announced in late February and early March. And so everybody was talking about COVID rather than uh, SCOTUS advocacy, and that's all right. We have a couple of cases uh, for which we're requesting U.S. Supreme Court review right now, and uh, neither has been granted yet. They're both in the uh, certiorari stage, and so we're in the process of getting them. So we don't know yet if we'll have another case up next term or if we will not. Enough said about that. Let me move on and say a word about um, contact tracing. As soon as I utter those words, uh, you know, the hairs on the back of people's necks go up, either because, um, you know, they're convinced that it's uh, absolutely evil or because they're convinced at the other extreme that if you even mention the words, you're out to, you know, destroy some sort of public health response. Uh, neither of those is, the view, is true in our view. Uh, but there are real issues, legal issues, privacy issues, business liability issues that are presented by the current scope of tracing. Tracing is a critical public health tool. Uh, it's been around for hundreds of years, but that doesn't change the fact that it's now being deployed on a scale never seen before in the United States, including in Kansas. The simple volume uh, of uh, tracking folks' whereabouts in order to figure out if they've come into contact with somebody who's COVID positive and therefore you need to perhaps isolate and certainly notify those uh, other individuals. The sheer volume of that presents issues that we haven't really had to wrestle with before. One of those, and I'm only going to focus on one, the liability issue, uh, one of those uh, arose in the context of a federal lawsuit that was filed in Lynn County, Kansas by two business owners. Lynn County was doing something that um, was unusual. The state, to my knowledge, has not done it, but the Lynn County local authorities were doing it. Uh, the local health authorities had entered an order that required businesses in that county, and maybe other organizations, but I know it included business, to, to maintain a list. When somebody came into your facility, you had to sign them in. You know, Derek Schmidt was here at the local True Value Hardware on this date, and to provide access to that list to the county health officials for the purpose of tracing. Now, that makes a lot of sense if you're a public health official and your exclusive goal is to figure out in the simplest manner who has had contact with whom. But on the other hand, if you're either the person who's being traced or the business who is under an order subject to penalty to now participate in the tracking of its customers, uh, you might have some objection to that. And in fact, the businesses did uh, brought federal suit in Lynn County. Um, uh, while the suit was pending, the uh, parties managed to work out their differences. Essentially, the county backed down and said, we're not going to try to compel businesses to collect this information for us anymore. If they collect it voluntarily, that's great. We'd like to use it, but we're not gonna compel that it be collected and we're not going to compel uh, that it be shared with us. If it is collected, we're going to ask. Uh, and we think that's the right approach. Now, all of that occurred before the legislature modified Kansas law. In fact, that case was part of the reason the legislature was interested in the subject when we brought it to their attention. 
Uh, and now there are, uh, there are statutory provisions that require the participation in contact tracing be voluntary that forbid uh, government officials from compelling businesses to collect that data and share it with them. It's the last, but you can't compel, you can't force without a search warrant. You can do it with a search warrant, but that's a whole different body of law. And, um, you know, we think there are a lot of reasons that made sense, but one of which is it eliminates the risk that uh, businesses take on liability for any, for example, uh, breach of privacy um, because they have been participating in this activity um, and, and requiring their customers to do so as a condition of dining, as a condition of dining there, buying their wares or whatever it may be. Uh, item number three I might just uh, share is spinning off of that, uh, another word about liability. I'm sure this is an area that some of you have followed with, with interest. Uh, this is obviously an extraordinary time, uh, unprecedented at least in modern history and therefore unprecedented because the last time the country, the world wrestled with something uh, of this scope in terms of a global pandemic. Our economy looked very, very different. And let's be honest, our liability system uh, looked very, very different. It was a lot less likely in say the late 19 teens and early 1920s that um, uh, somebody was gonna lawyer up and file a suit uh, because they got sick than it is today. I'm not saying that's bad or good. I'm saying it is a fundamental difference in how we tend to uh, legally apportion blame today compared with, uh, with prior times when we've gone through this. And that understandably has a lot of people worried. Um, there have been, you know, sort of knock down, drag out policy debates on what the right policy is, both in Topeka and I think they're about to come in Washington. Uh, sum it up to say this, the legislature in Kansas in June enacted actually several different liability restrictions uh, related to COVID, and if you if you try to boil it all down to a single sentence, the basic principle they tried to implement was that if you are a business or a forum, if you're a business, uh, and you are following all of the health guidance that you're supposed to be following, you're in compliance with masks, and you're in compliance with sanitizing, and you're in compliance with if, if you're at a point in time and in a place that there are uh, limits on the number of people who can enter, for example, you're in compliance with that. If you're, if you're in compliance with all of the guidance, then it means you're not negligent. Now, you may still be able to act recklessly or, or, or worse, and you're still subject to liability for that. But the concept, the policy concept was, if you're following all the rules that the public health officials tell you to follow, you are by definition not negligent. We'll see how that plays out uh, in the courtroom when real cases arise. Uh, they're almost certainly to arise, certain to arise in the private litigation context. It's not obvious to me how the AG's office, for example, would be involved in that. I would imagine it's likely to be um, a private litigant versus a private entity, and you know, we'll see how the courts sort it out. But that was the intent, as I understand it, of the legislature in that change, that group of changes, and we're, of course, watching it closely. Uh, it looks like there's going to be a very similar debate in Washington uh, when the Congress takes up the next round of uh, COVID response bill. I read in the papers, I think just this morning, that Senator McConnell is now saying there is going to be uh, another COVID bill. And uh, although I'm certainly not privy to any of the particulars, I also know that the leader has been uh, insistent that if there is to be another COVID bill, there will be liability limitations in it. So the fact that he's now saying there's going to be a bill uh, would seem to imply to me at least that uh, he, he thinks that there'll be sufficient support to include some type of liability limitation in the bill, but we'll all just have to watch and, and uh, watch and see. So enough on the liability piece. Uh, let me say a word about some of the consumer-related response, a COVID particular, that we've engaged in from the AG's office. Uh, I won't talk about this too much because, again, back to that point I made earlier, Consumer protection enforcement is one of those areas where the attorney general and every county and district attorney in the state share concurrent jurisdiction for the most part. And in Johnson County, Steve Howe, terrific prosecutor, uh, robust capacity. He likes to do his own consumer protection work and they're good at it. So generally speaking, we don't do a lot of consumer protection work from the AG's office in Johnson County because we're not needed. Uh, Steve handles it. Um, occasionally we'll do a case, but it's pretty unusual. That's very different from most other counties in the state. We do, in 103 of the counties, we are the principal consumer protection uh, enforcement agency, but Johnson and Sedgwick are the exceptions, and so a um, little bit different there. So I won't dwell on this, but I will just kind of share a couple of things that we've seen a lot of around the state. 
uh, since the, the COVID outbreak really erupted into the public debate uh, back in early March. Um, we've seen a lot of imposter scams, lots of them. I mean, they're out there all the time, but they have been redoubled during COVID. Uh, people pretending to be from the IRS and they want to talk to you about, um, uh, you know, the tax deadlines were extended because of COVID and you need certain information. They need certain information uh, in order to make sure that you don't get late fees and penalties or something like that. So a classic IRM gov IRS government imposter scam, but customized to the COVID environment. Um, We've seen a, a lot of price gouging complaints. Kansas, like many, but not all states, has a price gouging statute. Uh, in Kansas, it's called the Profiteering from Disaster Statute. It's only in effect during a time when a state of disaster emergency has been declared. Normally, that means that you know, a tornado struck Greensburg and the one county is a disaster area for a few months or, or longer while the response happens and you can't profiteer uh, in that area. This is of course different because this is a very long-term disaster. It was declared by the governor in early March. It's going to last until at least September 15th by law currently, and could be and probably will be extended beyond that by uh, further action of the governor and the legislature at that point. Um, and it applies statewide. So it's the first time I'm aware of we've had the price gouging law in effect statewide and certainly not for a long time. So it's presented some issues on enforcement that we've, uh, we've had to work through. The basic concept is um, the Kansas price gouging law prohibits what it calls the unjustified increase uh, in the price for necessary goods and services during a time of disaster. And an increase is presumed unjustified if the price succeeds, goes up by more than 25% compared with the price the day before the disaster. Um, and a good is necessary uh, for the response if it's something that consumers are likely to use more of because of the disaster in response. So you might not be surprised that um, uh, the first thing we got a lot of calls on was price gouging for hand sanitizer, Clorox wipes, and toilet paper hundreds of complaints and calls from around the state. Uh, we've run them down and so far uh, we've been able to work voluntarily with almost every uh, business that's been involved. Um, uh, haven't yet had to sue anybody, at least not any legitimate businesses, um, with respect to the price gouging law, which is a good thing. We've tried our best to work cooperatively on that. Uh, then, of course, uh, you know, they're just the straight up scams, uh, just plain crooks who are out to make bucks uh, right now because people are scared and lives are disrupted. Those come in in every, all the usual ways, uh, uh, spear phishing emails that are trying to get personal information, uh, tons of robocalls, just an unbelievable amount uh, of, you know, uh, crooks calling in and trying to uh, get folks to give money for uh, N95 masks. You can't seem to find them in your community, but we can sell them to you right now. Just give us your credit card. Um, uh, you know, we saw it on toilet paper and cleaning supplies early on. Uh, you know, we've seen the more extreme examples of uh, crooks peddling uh, alleged cures uh, to COVID, uh, which of course at this point uh, the medical community tells us don't exist. So uh, we've dealt with all of those as well. I'll be actually testifying this afternoon in uh, the U.S. Senate Commerce Committee on what Kansas has done to respond to all of these scams. And uh, we'll talk there about how we've really worked cooperatively with our federal partners, the different agencies of jurisdiction, because a lot of these scams, they, they come from out of the state or many of them come from overseas and, and we just can't actually physically reach them from the Kansas Attorney General's office, but sometimes our federal partners can. So we've really focused on that cooperative enforcement model and the, Federal agencies, uh, the regional agencies out of Kansas City have for the most part been absolutely terrific to work with. We've got a good relationship with them. Final thing I might just say a word about and then I'll stop the monologue and, and get a sense of where folks would like to go. Um, uh, obviously the, the discussion at the moment is schools. Uh, when are they gonna open and what's the opening going to look like? Uh, you all, if you follow this, uh, you know as much as I in terms of what the, the arc of the public narrative has, has been. We had the State Board of Education, which uh, uh, just days ago uh, rolled out a very long guidance document to assist local school districts in their planning for safe reopening. Then shortly after that, we had the announcement from the governor that she was going to both, two things, both delay the start of schools statewide until at least September 9th, and 
was going to make some of the uh, health and hygiene, the mask requirements, the hand sanitizing requirements, the social distancing requirements that were recommended by the state board. She's going to make those mandatory by using her authority as governor. She's now entered the first of those orders, which is the mask and sanitizer order. And she has announced the second order, but by law, it has to be considered and ratified by the state board before she can formally enter it. At this point, it's my understanding the state board is supposed to meet on that tomorrow. So there's a lot of uncertainty is the bottom line. Uh, my impression is everybody's trying to do what they think is the right thing. Um, there are a lot of different opinions on what the right thing is, both on the substance uh, and also on the process. And that's why we've really, again, back to my earlier point from the AG's office, we have really focused on process. Uh, our processes are designed to make sure that different points of view have meaningful input in decisions that are as momentous as this. And sort of skipping around process has the effect of cutting out voices, which we think is not A, lawful and B, helpful at a time like this. So uh, we'll see over the next few days how this plays out. Um, we gave legal input to the governor's team before she issued her orders. Um, I'll, I'll just say not all of our recommendations were accepted and you know, that's the way the system works. But um, I do think that there are probably some areas that we're gonna see a lot of dispute between local authorities and um, state authorities, the governor's office in particular, um, because of how some of this got framed and we'll see how it plays out. Um, but it's, you know, regardless of all that, at some point, uh, I'm optimistic, schools will open, kids will go back, um, we'll all do our best to make sure they're safe. And, uh, you know, if you're a person who prays, that's probably not a bad thing to include that in your prayers, because there's no question that having 500,000 people, that's our kids, go back to places where they are gathered together in a way they have not been gathered since March before spring break is going to present certain risks that we uh, we know we're there, and so uh, we all need to be working together to try to mitigate that. With that, let me sort of stop the monologue and get a sense on uh, where we might like to go. Thanks for taking time to, to do this conversation. Absolutely. Um, that was very interesting. So um, a couple of questions I've coming in and a couple that have been texted to me while I was sitting here. Um, you know, one, so I, I guess just based on kind of what you were just saying, that really to be determined what the liability of the schools would be if a teacher were to get sick or how that's still in process and where do you see that heading? I mean, is there any best guess on, you know, I follow a couple different um, things for my own children that are in, um, in middle and, and high school and they're parents, friends, and friends' parents, I guess it is, and all that. And everybody's got a different opinion on this, but really coming down to these teachers are really kind of, they're very, you know, cautious about going back and exposing themselves and their families. And um, what kind of liability do we have for those teachers or what protections do we have? Yeah, I mean, that, it, you know, teachers, kids, administrators, others who are in school facilities are all asking these sorts of questions. Um, my wife's not a K-12 instructor, but she is a professor at KU, and uh, they're having these discussions at the university level, and of course the, the public health issues are more or less the same, whether it's you know, a kindergarten classroom or whether it's uh, a law school, um, the basic questions are the same. Um, I know in our case, you know, Jennifer, my wife, she's very worried about it. She's asthmatic. She's in a susceptible category, but, um, you know, she's made the decision. She's going to go back and teach in person because at the end of the day, she thinks the kids that she teach on the whole expect that and deserve it. Um, she'll be masked up. Uh, KU, one of the things they're doing is they'll be providing uh, uh, plexiglass separators. I give her a hard time. You know, it's going to be like you're in one of those little uh, Star Wars boxes or something. You won't be able to <laughs> break out of it. You'll be in a bubble. Um, but they'll be taking those sorts of precautions. So I'm, my point in saying that is, you know, I've seen it from the personal family side as well as from the, the AG side, and I, I get it. Um, there's not a good answer. Uh, the bottom line is on the liability question in particular, setting aside, you know, the public health and what's the right thing to do to keep people healthy. On the liability question, 
the analysis, I think, is going to be a little bit different for schools than it is for businesses. Why? Because schools are public entities that are covered by the Tort Claims Act. So at the end of the day, the liability for a business is that business, its owners, its shareholders, whatever it may be. It comes out of their capital if there's a judgment against them for harm that they're found to have contributed to, and that may affect their ability to continue operating. For schools, the liability almost certainly ultimately rests with taxpayers. Uh, because under the Tort Claims Act, uh, the schools, like any other public entity, they would be subject to representation and indemnification by uh, either taxpayers directly or taxpayers indirectly if the school has a private insurance policy that you know, then their rates go up that have to be paid by tax dollars going forward. So I'm not suggesting it's a less important issue. I'm just suggesting the analysis is perhaps slightly different uh, from a liability standpoint strictly. Maybe that's a reason, you know, I mentioned there was some advice that we gave um, the governor on our most recent round of executive orders that wasn't taken, and this is an example. Um, you know, in the earlier statewide mask order, not the one related to schools that's under discussion now, but the one that was issued what was it, two, three weeks ago, I've lost track of time, mm -hmm. saying everybody must wear a mask except in certain circumstances. Um, that order, the way it was structured, actually imposed two different and independent sets of legal duties. And some of our business owners may be intimately familiar with this. It imposed a duty on individuals to wear a mask. So if you breach that duty, I go out and willfully, intentionally refuse to wear my mask, I could be liable for that. But it also imposed a duty on businesses and organizations to require their customers and employees to wear masks while on their premises. So, you know, if I'm a business owner and I don't require my customers when they come in to wear masks, I may be liable, my business may be liable for the misconduct of those employees. So that order imposed two different sets of liability. That is not the way the governor's current order related to schools appears to be structured. And the reason I say appears, the language on this point is really kind of hard to read. It's, it's written in the passive uh, tense, and so it's a little hard. You know, it's a little hard to know who has the duty. If you're if you're in a school activity and the kids aren't wearing, here's the example I give. I, I made this one up. Imagine you've got some you know rogue debate teacher out there who mm -hmm. says, "By God, my kids are going to have to practice and practice and practice together, not uh, over a video conference." And you can't get good practice for competitive debate with your mask on. So my kids are not going to be required to wear their masks in this room when we're preparing for debate. And somebody, you know, turns them in and they get busted. Who is liable for those kids not wearing their mask? And I think the answer is it's not clear at all under the language of the governor's order that was just issued. Because the language is in the past, it masks shall be worn. It wasn't kids will wear a mask, students will wear a mask, uh, faculty will wear a mask, it's masks will be worn by students, faculty, et cetera. So, you know, think of it this way. The ultimate enforcement of the mask, the school mask order um, is by the district attorney in Johnson County or the AG in some parts of the state. So if, I, if I've got that complaint in that hypothetical I just gave you, who do I think about suing for having refused to wear the mask? Do I sue the kids, most of whom are juveniles? That seems a little odd, but that's a possibility. Do I sue the debate teacher, who's the one who apparently, in my example, willfully said, you know, don't have to wear them here even though we're supposed to? not clear whether there's actually liability imposed at that level. Do I sue the district uh, or the school building leadership or the district leadership because they had some duty to enforce? Again, the language is unclear. So my only point in saying all that is, uh, personally, I, I just, I hope folks will just wear their masks and use their hand sanitizer and, you know, be respectful and use common sense because the enforcement is going to be potentially really tricky. Yeah. Um, I'm curious what your opinion is on there. I think it's in Kentucky. There was the case of the couple that tested positive for COVID-19, but then refused to sign the orders that they would quarantine and ended up now under house arrest. I mean, how, I guess it just would be interested in your take on that. Well, it strikes me as a bit extreme. Um, and, you know, the moment I say that, I'm not sure with this crowd, but I assure you, uh, as soon as you make a fairly flat statement like that, you got about half the folks just up in arms right now because people are really passionate on this. I think largely because people are scared and disrupted. Uh, and, you know, I, I get it, but I, I just cannot imagine a circumstance, at least based on the facts as they were presented in that case, you know, in the news media reports, 
um, where it would be appropriate for a government entity to really restrain the liberty, com com by compulsion, restrain the liberty of an individual that way. Um, but, you know, it could happen. You know, there are old, we get a lot of questions, and we have since March, on the limits of enforcement power here. And the bottom line is we don't want to test it. Uh, I mean, I don't want to test it as an enforcer, and I really don't want it tested. Um, because there are two big principles that are both in play. One is that governments have their maximum authority, and courts tend to be most deferential to that use of that authority when they're acting in a bona fide way with a straight face to protect public health, uh, you know, in good faith, trying to protect public health. Sort of the government ability is at its maximum. But the other principle that is equally true, and this is kind of back to my point where we're sort of the voice, maybe not in the wilderness, but the contrarian voice in a lot of these discussions, it's also true that neither our laws generally nor our constitution at all are suspended just because we're in the middle of a pandemic. People still have a Fourth Amendment right. People still have a Fifth Amendment right. There are still rights to privacy protected by law, uh, by statute, and otherwise. And uh, sometimes those two principles really get into tension. And to the extent we can avoid those fights, I think we're all going to be better off. Kentucky's a good example. Uh, Daniel Cameron's my counterpart out in Kentucky. He's a, he's a good guy. He's a first-term AG. And I, I sort of feel sorry for him because he has really been in the middle of uh, some of these fights. He got that case. Um, you know, he's been in litigation against his governor, who is the former AG, Andy Bashir, And, um, you know, not where any of us wants to be if we can avoid it. Mm -hmm. Certainly not if you're in your first year in office. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see. So do you intend to weigh in on the ongoing controversy between the governor and legislature on who has the authority to close schools? And you kind of uh, just touched on this. But um, did she overstep in the spring when she did so initially in that crisis? Well, I'm not sure. I don't think she overstepped uh, legally in the spring. Um, at that point, uh, you know, the way the Emergency Management Act, which was the statute that gives her these emergency powers, it's a statute enacted by the legislature that delegates to the governor during times of emergency certain powers she would not otherwise have. Um, and at that point, there were not restrictions in the Emergency Management Act that, um, you know, restrained her from using those powers to order schools closed. Mm -hmm. So you can debate whether it was a good idea or a bad idea, but at the end of the day, uh, I don't think legally, I, I think legally she was on pretty solid ground, and especially once the State Board of Education functionally acquiesced, um, certainly didn't take a contrary position. Now, fast forward to today, the rules are different today. Uh, mm -hmm. In June, when the legislature met first at the end of the regular session and then again in special session, um, and ultimately passed this large COVID response bill that had lots and lots of moving parts. It was often described uh, in press accounts as a compromise between the governor and the legislature. I'll leave it to others to figure out if it was really a compromise. But in any event, it, it became law. And it had lots of changes in it. But one of the sets of changes it had, it adopted new rules for how the governor may exercise those Emergency Management Act emergency powers during the remainder of this emergency on COVID. And it, one of the new rules it adopted specifically relates to school closings and requires, it forbids the governor from using her emergency powers to close schools unless her order to do so is ratified by a majority of the State Board of Education. So the board will be considering that order, like I said, uh, we think tomorrow. And then in addition, the legislature created several other sort of broader, I'll call them checks on the governor's use of her emergency powers, we believe included but not limited to the school closings, which is that there's this ability for county commissions to either opt out of a governor's emergency order or to adopt a less restrictive version in its county. Um, I'm not sure there's unanimity of mind among all the lawyers who have worked on this about how that rule applies in the school's case. I will tell you, in my view, it's not a particularly difficult legal question. The language of the statute's plain, and I think the opt-out provisions are in effect, both for the mask and hygiene order and for um, the delay order. And so, you know, I don't, I'm not encouraging counties to do that. I'm just saying I think that legal authority exists, and I won't be surprised if some counties decide they want to test the limits of that authority. And, uh, you know, We'll see how it all works out. It's really become a bit of a uh, of a mess. And uh, you know, when we write the 
the book someday we'll put in our reflections on why. Uh, and that's not the royal we will all write about this stuff, I suppose, but uh, <laughs> I do think some of it was avoidable and wasn't avoided. And so here we are. And uh, now there's bad blood between the governor and the legislature, which makes it even harder uh, to sort of work yeah. through some of this stuff. I know it is it is definitely a time that we need more unity um, on figuring these things out. Um, Sorry, just looking through some of these questions real quick. Um, one question that came in, um, your uh, Solicitor General was recently nominated to serve as a federal judge. Can you explain what a Solicitor General does um, and what's the status of the nomination and the impact of that nomination that will have, yeah. what will that impact have on your office? One of the employees that I have at the AG's office is a position that we call the State Solicitor General. It's a relatively common position among states today. It was not so common back in the 90s when uh, Carla Stovall first created the position in Kansas. Uh, it was retained through all these years by my predecessors from Carla until now. We have really expanded the office, uh, the, the role of the solicitor's position within the AG's office. Our Solicitor General is our principal appellate advocate. So right now, Toby Krause is the person that I've appointed to that. Toby's a great lawyer. I hope some of you know him. Good guy. Maybe I should say good lawyer and great guy. I don't know. He's a terrific fella. <laughs> um, we stole him, so to speak, from uh, Fulston uh, Law Firm. He was a partner there, and we convinced him to uh, give up the benefits of private practice and come work with us uh, and do some public service, and he was kind <laughs> enough to do that. And he's been, uh, he's been really very good. He's only our second solicitor in the history of this office. The previous one was Steve McAllister. Uh, who was first appointed by Carla Stovall and kept that job all those years with a little break in the action. And uh, I lost Steve as solicitor when he was appointed by the president to be the U.S. attorney for Kansas about three years ago. And that's when we brought Toby on board. And uh, now the president wants to make Toby a federal judge, and we're happy for him. I think he'd be a great judge. That's my, my pitch. Uh, I, I do believe that. Of course, I'm not wild about losing him as our appellate advocate. But, uh, but that's what our solicitor shop does in Kansas anyway. There are there are appellate attorneys and they're they're very good at what they do. Okay. Um, just looking through some of these, I think like you've answered some of them in your comments. Um, one quick question though: What can you do about the robocalls uh, since they're getting so so bad lately? Is there anything we can do? As a yeah, system? you know, here's my my best take on it. the The problem that's got everybody so infuriated on robocalls is at its core a technology problem. It's not a law enforcement problem. And what I mean by that, I mean, we've got good tools. If I can find you know, some of these robocallers, uh, particularly if they're crooks and scammers, but even if they're not, if they're just you know, a legitimate business that ignores the do not call law and is making you know, thousands of automated robocalls in violation of the law, if I can find them, I've got great tools, as do the feds and as do most other state AGs, to, to, to stop them. The problem is the vast, vast, vast majority of these robocalls that are now plaguing everybody, I can't find. And the reason I can't find Can I give you the number them, of the person that called me while we were talking? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we hear that a lot. And of course, as you know, uh, the number's not real. It's a spoof yeah. phone number. Uh, the call is almost certainly coming from somewhere offshore, probably in Central Asia or Southeast Asia somewhere, or maybe South Asia. Those are the most likely spots. Uh, they're generating millions upon millions of automated calls using often randomly generated or stolen, uh, improperly accessed um, phone numbers. The ones that drive me crazier when people, you know, when these robocallers falsely generate the AG's office as the phone number. And so Kansans answer the phone and think the Kansas AG's office is calling them, which happens. And of course, it's not us. We, it's some, you know, crook in, in, in wherever, Hyderabad or wherever they're calling from. And so, um, but it's a technology issue. As calls, as it became possible to generate such a high volume of nearly free calls from over halfway around the world, you know, the smarter crooks did what you'd expect them to do. They moved out of our jurisdiction, out of our reach, and now they're reaching into people's living rooms and cell phones from halfway around the world. And it's just almost impossible to find. So it's a technology-enabled problem, and I think it's going to require a technology-enabled solution. And that's the pitch we've made to Congress now for several years. Uh, just last year, Congress finally enacted, uh, the president signed into law what they call the TRACED Act. It's the latest federal attempt to require, um, essentially require the telecom carriers to make callback tracing possible. 
uh, for law enforcement purposes. So we actually can trace those calls backwards from the number that showed up on your cell phone <laughs> and figure out where it really came from. Because if we can find them, we got pretty good enforcement tools. Even if they're halfway around the world, by partnering with our federal partners, we can occasionally actually go out and get them. We did that maybe, I don't know, it's been eight or nine years ago, a lot, got a lot of attention. Uh, I remember the Wall Street Journal picked it up, but uh, working through the feds, we were able to break up some uh, call houses in, it happened to be, I think, near Hyderabad, if I remember correctly, it was in Southern India. Um, and they were generating these uh, IRS calls by the millions, you know, and um, it was all one large criminal operation. And that guy uh, who was running it actually wound up spending some time in a federal penitentiary for it. So we got to be able to find them. We can't find yeah. them, we can't enforce. Yeah, well, that makes sense. Well, I think in looking through the calls and just, I had a couple questions texted, but I think you answered one while you were speaking. Um, I think that's every question that I have. And I really, I, I, I thought this was fascinating. I could listen to you talk for another hour, but um, I know you have a lot of things to get to and um, really appreciate your time and your insight on um, a lot of different issues right now. So um, thank you so much, Attorney General Schmidt. And I hope that we have an opportunity to hear from you again in the future. Well, thank you, and thanks for enabling this, and thanks to everybody for participating. I really miss being out and visiting with folks because it's how we try yeah. not to drift into strange little eddies over here. So this is really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We'll stay healthy, and um, we hopefully will uh, get a chance to visit again. Sounds good. Thanks. Bye. Um, and uh, you know, I just want to give a, a shout out to our investor guild. You know. Doing these programs at no cost is really um, made possible by our sponsors. Um, you can see our Investor Guild listed there on the screen, American Family Insurance, uh, Advent Health, Bayer, Central Bank of the Midwest, the City of Shawnee, Waste Management, the Amos Family uh, Funeral and Crematory, uh, Complete Construction Service, Country Club Bank, Evergy, GBA, uh, Overland Park Regional, Shawnee Mission Ford, the University of Kansas Health System, and Zarda Ricky Development Corporation. Thank you to all of our investor guilds that help us to bring um, these quality programs to our members each month. Um, and also just a couple of notes on some upcoming um, opportunities and programs. First, uh, the Shawnee Economic Recovery Assistant Grants um, are live as of about uh, maybe an hour ago. Um, and so this is, uh, Grants are available for our qualifying non-essential businesses up to $5,000. So the details are on the City of Shawnee's uh, website right now. And then we will be, as a chamber, um, sending that out in an email and posting that on our social media. And of course, our staff is uh, ready and able to assist you with any questions. Um, I believe that the application deadline is about two weeks out. So there is some information that needs to be gathered and a, an application to be completed. but. Um, we stand ready to assist you uh, where we can on that. Um, and we'd also like to hear from you as we, uh, you know, we're hopeful that this fall that we would be able to do more in-person events. Unfortunately, with the um, continuing health situation, um, we are, are trying to still evaluating, as you know, we canceled the chamber uh, cookout that we were to have, I guess, or tomorrow. Um, so we want to hear from you. Tell us what you're thinking, what you're comfortable with. Please take, um, you know, it's not even two minutes to fill out the survey. The link is there. I think uh, Dustin's also put that in the chat function. Um, you should have received that in your email this morning. Um, please let us know what your thoughts are. Um, and we are working to craft programming that is responsive, whether to, to your needs, whether it be online or in person or both. Um, and you do have a chance to win um, $10 to uh, the new McLean's market. So um, definitely worth your and um, finally, we do have a, a couple more online opportunities for you. Uh, July 23rd, we will have the 10th State uh, Senate District uh, Candidate Forum. Um, that's with candidate Tom Cox and candidate Mike Thompson. Um, I would um, highly encourage you to participate in that. This is a very um, important race in our state. And so I think that um, it would be great to have your participation. And if you have questions in advance, please email them to me or Dustin Wolf um, on our team or Kevin Fern, and we will make sure that we get those in front of the candidates. 
And then um, also our uh, SEDC uh, third quarter investor briefing will be on August 5th, and we will be hearing from the new president, Dr. Um, Andrew Bound, uh, with the Johnson County Community College. This uh, EDC event, um, we are opening up to all of our chamber um, during this time. We think that this is an important person um, in our community for you to hear um, from about how they are hoping to help educate uh, their students in the fall, and then also our partnerships that we have with um, uh, on workforce development, talent recruitment. So um, please schedule some time on August 5th to join us to listen to um, President Dr. Bound. And then of course, we've got some ribbon cuttings. Again, McLean's Market um, in downtown Shawnee will be on July 30th. And then AM Connect will be in person on August 5th and August 19th at the Hy-Vee uh, Market Grill. So um, it's, it is great to get out and see each other in person. Um, so I would encourage you to come and stop by um, any or all of those events as well. And I believe that's it. Um, again, thank you all for taking the time to join us today. Uh, another thank you to the Attorney General's Office for their time and coordination. And um, I look forward to seeing you either online or in person in the upcoming months and weeks. Thank you. Have a great day.